welcome to Soul Play. On today's episode, I am delighted to welcome a practitioner of shibari, the ancient Japanese art of decorative bondage, and a passionate advocate for its therapeutic potential. Our guest today is Katie Bird, a shibari artist, spiritual seeker, and a healer who creates safe spaces where the body and soul can communicate. Katie is fueled by questions of what lies below the surface of everyday human interactions, cultivating depth and meaning, discovering levels of intimacy and play, finding internal and external freedom in the world, and empowering others on the journey of healing and transcendence. Katie's earlier childhood spiritual background inspired her to be a self-healer and to make meaning and understanding of the existential dilemmas regarding self-identity, self-knowledge, past experiences, beliefs, and desires. Aware that old traumas can be stored in the body, Katie weaves conscious communication into her relationships and work, emphasizing nonviolent communication, authentic relating, conflict resolution, and building conscious intimacy. Through kink and play spaces, Katie teaches somatic and embodiment practices for self and co-regulation. She is a creative and a healer, making ritual and meaning of major life themes. In this enlightening discussion, Katie delves into her personal journey with Shibari, illustrating how it serves not only as a tool for self-exploration, but also as a conduit for guiding others towards profound self-discovery. Katie shares stories and reflections of clients who have found healing, self-awareness, and empowerment through Shibari. Touching upon themes of consent, boundaries, trust, and the complex interplay between pain and pleasure, she underscores the vital role of authenticity, vulnerability, and communication both in the ropes and everyday life. This conversation invites listeners to explore the depths of being and consciousness through the artful embrace of Shibari, fostering a deeper understanding of oneself and the interconnectedness of human experience. And without further ado, I welcome Katie Bird. Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you. So at the top of the set here, I've introduced you to our listeners, but if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to introduce yourself, let us know who you are and what Soul Play means to you. Okay. Well, I'm Katie Bird. I think that the root word of me is like an artist and adventurer. I think that's like the the core. And then from there, everything else extends. But yeah, for me, I live a life of living on the edge and challenging comfort zones and going into more risky places, all with the idea of personal development and growth and healing and empowerment as like the, yeah, the undertone of all of it. That's how I reflect on my own experiences. And with that, I am able to guide others to reflecting on their experiences in a similar way. So be it in the past when I was working in like an outdoor setting, like teaching people in high risk situations like rock climbing or rappelling or mountain biking, to now working with Shibari, where it's a similar level of fear or uncertainty or vulnerability, where I'm able to also be with them in an experience and guide them to understanding these parts of themselves. So that's how those two worlds in me collide. And then soul play, which I love that. <laughs> so nice. Thank you. Like I just see, I just see my own soul playing around and I'm like, oh, how does my soul play? And I think that Shibari, Bari is a really beautiful way for the the soul to understand itself on such a deep somatic level and to feel the depths of what's stored in our bodies through memory, through experience, through emotion, also intimacy with another or vulnerability with another. That doesn't necessarily have to be in a sexual context. That can be just in proximity and closeness and being witnessed in an experience. All of those things to me are intimate. Wow. So much to unpack there. Thank you for sharing and giving us some insight. Just for the listeners, for a bit of background in case they don't know what Shibari is, which before I met you, I would say I was unaware. So could you give a bit of context there? So Shibari is a Japanese word. It means to tie. And Shibari itself originated from Japan. It has a, I would say, like a very cool slash dark history. It originated as a, as a martial art, as a way to snare captives. And then through binding them and holding them captive and then determining what their punishment is. And the different ties would indicate different things. So a certain sort of body tie would indicate the severity of the crime and also what this person was in society, like what their social status was. And this is interesting because it's it's exposing because you're getting tied in a way that like indicates, oh, wow, I, I did a really terrible crime and I'm this person in society. Then they would also tie in a certain way that would provoke emotions of shame. Or humiliation. For instance, in Japanese culture, exposing the armpit is considered shameful. Certain ties would do that. So they really play with emotion. 
And then later that wasn't necessary. That form of martial art wasn't utilized by the the police in that way anymore. And then it became more eroticized. And I think more artistry came into it and in exploring it. And then it became exposed to Europe and America. And now it's it's running through the veins of a lot of people in both Europe and the States. And there's different translations of it. I mean, shibari is the art of tying the body. It's very much a process. Like it is the art of playing with the body, with tying the body, untying the body, and that being the experience. And that being said, many people go into the ropes for different intentions, like different desires for what they want from their shibari experience. Wow. Thank you for the context. Yeah, really interesting history. Dark, as you mentioned, sure. But it sounds like there's been a lot of healing and exploration involved for yourself and with clients. How did you find the ropes and what has been your personal journey with the ropes? So my my rope experience like the that I had before was in more of an artistic context, not related to shibari, and then like through rock climbing and rappelling. So that was like my, my first introductions mm-hmm. and like outdoor survival. And then when I discovered shibari, I had seen it and I wasn't interested because I was like, that's just some strange sex stuff and I'm not into that. The idea of being bound by someone in a sexual context did not sound appealing to me whatsoever. So I was turned off and and it was a no. And then in a workshop, I just kind of stumbled into one and we were learning how to tie and being tied. And what I gained in that first class was was really pivotal for me because I felt both sides. Like I was tying and I was like, oh, wow, it's so cool to like play with the ropes and explore this texture on my hands and with another person and being mindful of their body. But I also felt this sense of like control that I had over them and also their surrender and like they're allowing me to do this and they're trusting me to tie them. And at moments, this sense of power felt terrifying to me, like in different activities we're doing. I was like, wow, I have authority over them. And it scared me a little bit. And then on the flip side, being tied and receiving the rope was very sensual in a sense of just different sensations all over the body, softness, intensity, rigidity, just different, different feelings, and also polarity and sensations, like how I could be tightly bound and feel this restriction, but then this tender touch. And it started to just mess with my mind a little bit. And then being untied gave this huge, almost euphoric release, where I just felt like I was in complete bliss. So this really enticed me to discovering more about shibari because I started to see that it not only does it uh, impact my body on a somatic level by changing my level of consciousness. I mean, I was altered to the point where I couldn't speak for a couple hours because I was just floating from the experience. So that was intriguing to me. Also, it stoked my fears on both sides of tying and receiving the rope. My fears of authority or my fear of, of having power and also my fear of someone abusing me or hurting me or taking advantage of me which those things were directly related to me. So I saw it as information to learn how to empower those parts of myself. And I wanted to explore that with myself. Yeah. So to me, it was just multidimensional. It wasn't just like getting tied in just for fun. That was an aspect of it. But to me, there was so much resources and so much information within every moment in the ropes. Wow, what a journey. And how long have you been practicing now since that kind of initial mind-blowing experience? Been almost three years. And you're in it deep. Like you're doing it regularly, you're having clients now. Yeah. When I first discovered it, I became pretty passionate and I was tying every single day, like no breaks, just dedicated to learning and also dedicated to seeing what people were experiencing within the ropes and what they wanted to bring to the table to explore and what we could co-create. Thank you for sharing. It sounds like it's been a journey inward, right, of discovering fears and perhaps insecurities. It's one of the major reasons I wanted to bring you on. It's such a form of exploration, of accessing ourselves with another, also being witnessed and being seen. It's so vulnerable. What does that look like? How do you hold space for emotional healing through the ropes with someone? Mm -hmm. Could you kind of walk us through what that may look like. I'm sure there's infinite possibilities here, but just a bit of an idea so we can paint a picture. So actually, one thing I want to say before I answer that question is that not all shibari is considered healing. Many people, if they have that idea, then go to a shibari experience might be have a brutal awakening because to me, it's intention. Ropes aren't innately healing. I think it's the facilitator, the space holder, and the intention of the person coming in deciding that that's what they want to explore together. Because many people have different interests for why they go into shibari. Healing is a very small fraction of the population who's doing ropes for healing. I'm one of those people who finds that very fascinating and sees it as a huge tool for 
people to find aspects of themselves for deeper analysis, to work with a therapist or work with a coach or work with me on a somatic level to opening these portals and these doors of understanding and empowerment through action. And that to me is the healing proponent of it. Thank you for clarifying yeah. because it's very important, it is right? Important. We don't want to guide anyone in, no. in incorrect directions. And there's there's room for it all as long as it's consensual and people know that what they're going into. I think what I'm so drawn to with your experience with the ropes, because I've had the pleasure of being tied by you as well as I've attended some of your workshops and it's been a deep dive for me, which I'm continuing to integrate. So I appreciate the healing aspect of the ropes, but yes, very valuable to remember that it can be seen in many, many contexts, which I'm sure you'll go into later. Yeah. What I think that the ropes brings to the surface that can be looked at as far as healing is that it's a dance with control and surrender. And most people have issues with control and surrender and releasing control and this idea of also being witnessed or seen in an experience. I mean, I can say for my own life when certain times when I've been really sad or really hurt, I'm in isolation, right? I isolate. And so people don't witness me experiencing these things. And with the ropes, I really encourage people to bring whatever's there and it can stir fear and discomfort and uncertainty sadness, sometimes memories that when they come to the session, that it's not even on the forefront of their mind, but then like a certain sort of touch or a certain position or a certain anything can provoke these memories from their past that they haven't ever thought of. And then they're back in that story. And then what is interesting in that perspective is that they're back in that story, but then they're being witnessed by me in that story. And then I can meet their need of tenderness, of care, of sweetness while they're in this extreme discomfort, which they didn't have in their original story. And this is a huge rewrite that people experience. And it happens often, actually, in the sessions I have where people start reliving something and it's unpredictable. Like it's if you tried to summon it, I don't know if you can. It's like the body's like, ah, now's the moment. And it happens a lot. And it's to me, it's really beautiful to take this experience where someone was once alone and then to have someone caring for them in the live moment to rework it. Yeah, to rewrite and heal, you know, because again, back to somatics, we house so much in our body, both known and unknown. And to access it, especially in those moments where the universe just delivers you a memory. If you could write it, we wouldn't know, right? I think accessing those moments in the time, letting it unfold and unravel, no puns exactly. intended. And one thing I appreciate about the ropes that I, I really try to emphasize is that most of the time it's, it's a nonverbal space, but of course, talking is always possible. But one thing is like the emotion and I make an invitation for the emotion to be there. Are you angry? Are you sad? Are you excited? Like what's the emotion and express it, feel it. If you will feel like screaming, scream. If you feel like crying, cry. And I really try to emphasize communication with whoever I'm working with. And I, I do some guidance and coaching on that with my clients to make sure that we're entering the space in a safe way. But I've noticed in my own experiences with crying, like someone is always trying like, oh, don't cry. It's OK. They try to stop the flow and they switch gears like I'm crying. And then they're like, oh, she needs a hug. So they start hugging me. But in my ropes and these experiences, I've had people start crying and I just keep going. Allow it. I keep to tying be. and I, I check in and I, we have a system for that. But the, the check in system allows them to have their experience. So if they want to cry, I allow them to cry. I just keep doing my thing and I don't stop and just start rocking them or calming them down. I let them have it have what they want. And of course, if it gets to a point where they're like, oh, I just need this, we switch gears. Like I'm, I don't, I'm not pushing a certain agenda. I'm just allowing it to exist, mm -hmm. which to me is such a gift. That's something that I've craved in my life is sometimes I just want to be mad and I don't want someone to be like, cool down or be this, or I just want to be sad and I want to scream and I want a temper tantrum and I want to be seen. And I just want the person to listen to me, but not to change the dynamic and let that thing just pass through me. So that's something that I, I value in the spaces. And is so needed. This really actually makes me think of, you know, a lot of these stories bring us back to our childhood, et cetera, but it really reminds me of children and how epic they are at communicating. You know, when they're sad, they cry. When they're angry, they show you. When they're tired, they fall asleep. There's none of these stories and excuses from stepping away from our truth. And I think providing your clients a space where they can truly show up and not be coddled or feel bad because, oh, well, she's changing her action now, so maybe I should stop. All this mental play gets introduced to what once upon a time was just purely expression, emotional expression. Wow. Amazing. I imagine there's a lot of fears that come up for people both before they get tied, during, and potentially after. So maybe we'll go in order here. You meet a client. 
how do you create a trusting and safe environment? Before you go into the ropes, do you require knowing much about their history, for example? If you could kind of speak on what that looks like, if there's a general path that you take, or if it is, in fact, unique with every client. Yeah, I want to say that it's probably unique with every client. There is like maybe a general thing that I do and I approach. First, someone's curious. They want to know. Then it's like a meet and greet. Like, do I feel a connection to them? Because also it's a co-creation. It's very intimate. To me, there's, there needs to be some sort of connection. I don't just tie everyone. That's not, not my desire or my role. Like, I really want to feel like, oh, there's an alignment here and there's mm-hmm. safety. Like, we see each other. And then it's intention. What are they curious about? Some people are like, hey, I just want to make some cool art. Like, I have this vision of going to the mountains and being tied with all these ropes. And it's like, cool. The, the intention is making something artistic. Or maybe the intention is to go in a deep dive into a, some sort of healing space. Or maybe it's to connect deeper with their partner. And I create a co-creation with them and their partner together. So really, it depends on what their curiosity is. And then I meet that and create that with them. Then it's getting to know each other. Like, what's your story? What's alive? Why are you curious about the ropes? What's intriguing you about this? What's your relationship with control and surrender? Do you feel comfortable expressing your boundaries? What are your boundaries? How do you feel about communication? Have you ever had any struggles with communication? Like, have you ever frozen or not been able to speak? Or do you ever fawn and just start acting like everything's okay when it's not? Do you have sexual trauma? And how does that fit into this? Do you have sexual desire? And does that fit into this? So I ask questions and I really try to get a a sense of the person. And there's many, many more questions I ask, of course. But to me, it's kind of like going on a date. Like the first time I meet a client, it's a meet and greet. We get to know like many of these things. And then it's our first dance together. And if someone's never been tied, there's a lot of uncertainty. They don't know how it's going to go. They don't know how it's going to feel. They don't know how they're going to feel. So I think that with the more exposure one has to the ropes, they start to learn more about what they desire and where they want to go and build more confidence and comfort within it. Beautiful. Thank you. I mean, that's a really beautiful introduction into how to create a safe and trusting environment. And then once you've connected and you feel the connection, you move forward, you're planning for the day to tie. So they come to you and to then enhance that trust and safety further. I remember in our sessions, you talked a lot about consent and you just brought up the word boundary, which is paramount in tying. Could you talk about the role of the tire, the person in control versus surrender, like you're tying, someone's receiving, and what that looks like if someone does have a tendency to freeze? For example, we're talking a lot about the nervous system, so they're freezing, they're unable to really express their needs, or if they're a fawn or a people pleaser and, oh, it's okay when it's actually not. So do you have exercises and examples of ways to really empower people to rewrite that story too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, then through the conversation piece before ropes are on the body, we start to discover that. And usually this Mm -hmm. person knows if they've had that experience or not. Like, have you ever been in a situation where these things have happened? And they're like, yeah, yeah, totally. Then I know that there's a potential that that can happen with us. And I really am like, let's explore this. I'm going to do some check-ins while we're doing the ropes and let's check your level of honesty. Let's check. I want to empower you to practice. So let's make a practice of this. So depending on the person's needs, we cater the sessions however. Like I've tied someone where the entire time they talked and told me every single thought they were having about me, about the dynamic, about how they thought I was feeling, about how they wanted to lie about how they were feeling the whole time because they just wanted to really be present with what was happening. And then sometimes we pause and talk and they would emote about whatever was going on. And I'm okay for that because this is the somatic experience. And to me, it's a practice. Boundaries and consent and communicating is a practice. And it's something I'm going to be doing the rest of my life with different scenarios and different people and different dynamics. And because this is intimacy, it's intimate. So it brings up a lot of intimate relational issues when we go into the ropes. Our core wounds around our parents, our core wounds around lovers, our core wounds around many things. So with boundaries, a lot of people come and they're like, I don't know, I'm open. And I'm like, wait, 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 what does that even mean? (laughs) Like, people don't know their boundaries. Yeah, this is a common theme, you know, that keeps coming up with people that I'm talking to around the mic here. And in life in general, we were not shown boundaries. We We knew what they were, but we were told like, like, I don't want to do that. You have to do it anyways. I don't like how they touch me. Yeah, but it's grandma. She gets to touch you how she wants. Mm -hmm. People are taught like they, they have sensations and they know. But then they're told it's not what you think. And so then they disassociate and they disconnect from their truth on these things. They don't think they have a say because they haven't had a say. So it's tricky to get back in alignment with what is ours and what other people put on us. 
And it is a practice. I'm still discovering mine and I will continue to. In certain situations, I feel really empowered to share my boundaries. And in other ones, I'm like, hello, Katie, say, <laughs> say it. And I'm like, why am I freezing? But it's mm. to me, it's a, it's a life discovery. It's a practice, just like a meditation practice or a yoga practice. You have to show up and do it. So in my work with boundaries, similar things. We, we lay on the table the options of what can be explored. And if they don't know, then I just try a bunch of different things and we talk about it. Like, how did this go for you? Where did you feel like you really were feeling safe or feeling threatened or you enjoyed a certain sensation or you weren't feeling so secure? Maybe this is where we just start to map out where the boundaries are. That's just one way, but there's many ways that we start to look at the boundaries. Wow, this is so linked to mental health and well-being and acknowledging areas for growth and expansion within ourselves. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Okay, so we're in the ropes. We're discussing boundaries. You're giving ample opportunity for your clients to be honest, it sounds like. After the session or as the session is coming to a close, I'm sure there can be lots of emotions that also arise for you. The story that you first shared, it sounded like you were quite full of bliss. As the pendulum swings, I imagine people can come out and be very emotional or upset or feeling tender and vulnerable. What does that look like as it comes to a close, as you then send your client on their way, perhaps to see them again and perhaps to not see them again? Like, what does closing that and integration look like? Well, I will say that every one of my sessions, they're never the same. None of them are the same. And I really allow intuition, spirit, and our presence of each other to guide the journey. And so as the session comes to a close and ropes are coming off the body, just tuning into what the person needs. Maybe they need some space or maybe they need to be covered in a blanket or maybe they need to be held in some way. And I actually want to share a story on this if I can. Oh, please. <laughs> Always welcome. Yeah. Yes. So I had a, um, an experience with a client, a male client, and went into the rope journey together. And the emotional dynamics throughout the tying was like a sweetness in the beginning. And then he got really fiery and like kind of this, he had this look in his face, like he kind of wanted to hurt me and he was frustrated. So there was this like taunting, this playing happening between us. And it's all nonverbal. I mean, there can be verbal things happening for sure. I can say whatever I want and he can say whatever he wants, but sometimes it's really this dance of just interpreting body language and moods. And I was kind of taunting him and playing with his discomfort and, and he was getting more agitated, but in like kind of a playful sort of way. And then we came down and then I untied and he was laying down and I felt a strong feeling in me that I needed to lay a blanket over top of him and lay beside him and just hold him. And as soon as I did that, he started bawling, crying. And I was like, okay, well, something is here. I don't know what, but something's here. And afterwards, he shared that in the ropes, when I started playing with his discomfort, it reminded him of when he was younger and how he used to fight with his mom. And they would just verbally just attack each other, like bam, 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 just firing back at one another and yelling and screaming and throwing one-liners and just trying to wound each other. And he felt that dynamic with me, this push and pull, like you're hurting me, I'm hurting you, just wanting to, to fight each other. And then ultimately in his experience in the past, he would run away and run to his bedroom and hide under the covers. And she would come in and she would yell at him through the covers and he would hide under there and he wouldn't say anything more. He would be quiet in there in this experience where he's recalling me as the mother and then in the end I untie him and I lay the blanket on him he's under the blanket and then I come and I hold him mm, there's a rewrite and it just for him it's the only time that he had love and tenderness in a moment of like this extreme vulnerability so yeah it touched him deeply and this I'm not alone like I am loved I'm seen I'm cared for like it just was so powerful and so for him like the integration was focusing on that he really kept that and he really worked with that and journaled about that for, for days. And we spoke on it numerous times afterwards. And he just felt like he was released from something really heavy because he experienced love and tenderness in a place where he always experienced a wound. So integration for every single person, depending on what comes up, is completely different. And I just try to cater that however is necessary, whether it's checking in over the next few days or going into another session to go deeper into something or... After my sessions, typically I'd create time for, for speaking. If you want to share about your experience, if you want to ask questions, if you want to talk, whatever. Sometimes people are quite altered also. Altered in the sense of like their body, they can feel really high. And then that, sometimes that scares people. I had a woman who had never experienced that in her life. And she experienced it because she surrendered. And it's the first time she really surrendered. And then she got in touch. She's like, I'm ready to... Wait, I, actually, I feel weird. I'm like, yes, it's okay. Let's just sit and relax. And just being with someone as, as their moving through that and making sure that they're, they're safe to, to go about their way. But yeah, integration to me is it's different per person. 
different and necessary, no yeah. matter how it presents. And the idea of making yourself available for conversation and, and knowing that they're not alone through this. And I think like you mentioned, journaling, for example, reflecting, talking about the experience, exploring potentially with a therapist, the things that come up like this is so linked to sure. mental health physical and emotional well-being. And I say the same things in my workshops, actually. Like, it's like a line that I've definitely said where it's like, if you came here to not get triggered, like maybe you should go because something <laughs> in here is going to activate you. And it's not that I'm trying, but the thing is, is like when you're working with a partner, whether it's a stranger or a lover or whatever, something is going to stir. And it's usually the things in your relationship that have already been there, but it just brings it right to the surface very fast. And numerous times in my workshops, couples come to me and they're like, oh, we were fighting all night. Like we had struggles because this issue is here and it's been in our relationship the whole time, then I, I offer the support that I can in my understanding to the best of my abilities. And also, I'm not afraid to suggest them to a therapist and say, hey, share everything because we've done the groundwork. You've yes, done the it's groundwork. come to the surface. To the There's surface. awareness now. And please hold on to this yes. gold. This it's is gold. honesty. It's gold. I mean, let's see what's meant to arise and work through it rather than jump over it, mm. go around it. It'll keep coming up. You know, it, it sounds like comparable to psychedelics, like poof, it's a journey, like it sends you there rather than meditating every day. It might take some time to get to a lot of the, the depths of this gold and these insights and whatever path we take is the right path. And sometimes it can also be overwhelming and maybe feel like a bit too much to really handle through the ropes or in psychedelics or this or that. So I think finding adequate support, whatever that means for you and acknowledging if it is a therapist, speak about these things. Yeah. And one thing I like about the robes, so you mentioned psychedelics, is that many people have mentioned that it has this quality of experiencing things on multiple dimensions of the present, the past, some other dimension, some other sensation coming in and out of consciousness. And I think that's a really beautiful thing to experience within a sober state of being. Yes. Like the Get high on your own supply. And yeah. just also seeing these different levels of yourself. Thank you for sharing. If I can share... My first experience with the ropes with you, I was actually suspended. And so my background is as a labor and delivery nurse when I was living in Canada. I've always had interest in pain and the psychology of pain and how pain presents and how it comes and goes like anything else. You know, the nature of reality is impermanent, including these states. For me, it was one thing to be tied but then when I was suspended, that tightness and those sensations were amplified tremendously. And for me, I remember it was a very internal yet expansive, very inward, unable to communicate verbally with you. I felt very held and safe. So it allowed me to surrender into sensations. Like I know we haven't super gone into this yet, but that was such a profound experience to experience the sensation of what one could say was quite excruciating pain and witness it for what it was from an aerial view almost and not put fear or oh I'm in so much pain or like mind and intellect combining with that sensation so instead just observing the sensation of pain and watching it dissipate and change mm -hmm. and move and evolve I found that very beautiful to be honest because it's just like psychedelic like a return to the nature of being it is impermanent and through connecting with our breath trusting in this this oneness allowed me to find peace in suspension you know for a period again it was only that one time that I had experienced it but is this a common thing do you still use suspension occasionally or oh yeah always I'm happy that you brought this back up because it's a study that I really enjoyed doing and I remember really getting into this whole thought process around wanting to change this word pain because there's many more definitions of it than I think just this one word. Because for me, like when I think about pain, there's resistance. And mm -hmm. actually, it's just intensity. It's intensity. And actually, pain is resistance to the intensity. So when there's an allowance of the intensity and observation of the intensity, just like women in labor, observation and allowing, because in resistance, we contract, we hold, we try to escape, we move away. We clench our muscles, we block oxygen flow, we block blood flow, then it creates more tension, more locking, fear, fear, like it just, it creates more intensity, which equals more pain. <laughs> yes, yes. But it's, and then it blocks fluidity. So like what you're speaking to is really beautiful because it's like, ow, this is really intense. I'm breathing, I'm relaxing, I'm allowing, I'm feeling. And it, of course, if there's ever a point when it's too much, it's too much and you say, it's too much and it's okay. And a lot of it is in the mind. It's yes. a fear of like, oh, this is, 
is this hurting me or is this too much or whatever? Or like our mind goes crazy kind of with like free diving, you know, it's yes. like you have the breath capacity to stay down longer, but your system starts throwing all these. I've never flags. done this before. Yeah. I could die, blah, blah, blah. I can and die. it's intellect. And it's, it's, it's not true. Mind activity, yeah. not intellect, just mind activity. Mm. So, and then you have to start overriding that system because it's just programmed to shout at you, but it's not accurate. Of course, I also want to say that the ropes are dangerous. And even when being the safest you can be, injuries can happen. So I also honor when things don't feel right. And even people are in bliss and things go wrong. They didn't feel a single pain and later they discover that something happened. It's a dangerous thing, just like driving your car or riding your bike in traffic. Things can happen. We're human flesh bags running around. <laughs> We're destructible. But the messages that we can receive in this is this allowing of discomfort, like how to sit in discomfort. This is the practice because mm -hmm. many of us, including myself, are avoiding discomfort, avoiding heartbreak, avoiding hunger, avoiding this. Like I'm afraid to feel hungry, so I'm always eating or I'm afraid to to have my heart broken. So I'm not fully opening myself like I'm afraid to hurt fear of being hurt, fear of pain. Mm -hmm. And so one of the practices within the ropes is allowing and it's just like uncertainty. I don't know where this is going. Is this going to get more intense? Is it going to change? And how can I just breathe and accept? Accept. This is surrender. And when you move into a surrender, then you can find more pleasure because you're just allowing. Surrender. Okay, I don't know how long this is going to be. I'm going to breathe. And then you make an okayness. So you're not counting the seconds of how long you're in this position. You start to just let it go. And then you find other parts like, oh, okay, so my shoulder hurts, but how does my foot feel? Or how does my knee feel? And you put your attention somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the person tying you puts your attention somewhere else. Like there's been when moments where I remember I was tied by one of my teachers. I told her I wanted an intense session. I was like, <laughs> I want to like, I want int intensity. And she tied this rope on my neck. And I was like, okay, I think I can do this for another minute. This isn't going to last. And then she started doing something with my hair and with my foot and with this and with that. And I completely forgot about the rope on my neck. So something that I thought could only last a minute or two minutes or whatever that I was panicking about because of other sensations and my attention going somewhere else, I completely forgot about it. And at one point I thought she had taken it off and she had not. And this really was like, what is it? If something is so terrible, but then actually I can, I can forget about it, then what is it actually? What is it actually? What a play on consciousness and, and exploring other dimensions and like the, the captivity of the mind that it can offer this chained reality of no, you will live in accordance to these stories. This is bad and this is good and this is bad and bad and bad and bad. Pain is to be feared and bliss is to be sought. I think the reality too that comes with what you're talking about is it's so beautiful to lean into these moments of, of fear and discomfort and rewriting like what pain is, right? Mm. Like as, just escaping from this dualistic lens of we need to go towards the good and go away from the bad. It's okay to lean into these experiences and see what comes of it. I mean, think of childbirth. You get a baby. You bring a child into this world. And yes, for many women, it can be absolutely like excruciating and painful and spiritual and beautiful and difficult and tragic. I mean, there's the whole spectrum of this experience, yet something so beautiful comes from something so quote unquote painful. The path to making these experiences a bit of a spiritual journey and going inward and playing with consciousness, playing with edges, playing with getting to know yourself and what you need in those moments and communicating, like you said, through boundaries and even just saying what you need. Yeah. To me, it's also like an invitation of the spectrum of emotion because yeah. a lot of, a lot of us are programmed like crying is bad. Sadness is bad. Anger is bad. Grief is bad. And we, there's a resistance to certain emotions and only happiness is acceptable. And by only us trying to live in a happiness state, we're neglecting so many parts of ourselves that actually need to be seen or expressed or shown to others, but we're afraid to do that. So to me, like the, what I also appreciate about the ropes in this way is an invitation to allow all to exist, inviting in the discomfort. Let yourself feel discomfort. What does discomfort look like to you? How do you feel about this? Mm -hmm. You know, emote that, express that instead of suppressing that. And this also goes back into the boundaries. By expressing yourself, Truly and honestly, you start to know where your boundaries are because you're being authentic and you're being honest with yourself. So it's like this authenticity is important, but we've been inauthentic and not showing our true faces like I'm sad or I'm happy or I'm aroused or I'm excited. And we suppress because of shame, of fear, of rejection, of all these things. We're dishonest with ourselves. Always. Often. <laughs> oh, <shit>. Always often. <laughs> always yes. often. I say always. Always isn't a thing I can say, but often. 
I'm often dishonest with myself and I am working to be more honest with myself. Authenticity is, is a value of mine and I want to be in my authenticity. Thank you. Thank you. And I mean, that's why I brought you on, right? I think it's so inspiring to see people that are escaping this status quo, these boxes of yeah, you need to live within this parameter. Like what you said, I echo happiness is welcome, joy is welcome, other emotions less so in my upbringing. And that's okay that it happened, but it's beautiful to meet it in its reality where we're at now. And what can we do about it? And how can we get in touch with our truth? How do we take off these layers to get to it? And it's scary, but we're not alone, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I think having these modalities, if it resonates, for example, with the ropes to go in, with some intention of seeing what's alive in there is, is a beautiful opportunity for people. And I'm very grateful for my time with you in the ropes, really, you know, especially with exploration and wow. So I would like to ask about a transformational experience. I know you've given some examples of experiences that people felt in the ropes with you, but if you wouldn't mind sharing another, I mean, that would just be amazing to give some context to the listeners of examples of things that can arise. Yeah, I want to share two different ones. One's a little shorter in the beginning, but more relevant to the workshops. But just the emphasis that, that I want to continue to share in these spaces is emphasizing ways that we can play together safely with boundaries and consent and check-in systems and figuring out systems together so that we can go deeper together. Because safety is something that you build from within. And then when you feel safe with another, you trust, you can trust yourself. You can't just trust someone else. You have to trust yourself to be able to go deep into something. And so I had a client who she went to my workshops and she was getting a lot about the communication with how to talk to her partner about certain things around their intimacy or even just their social life. They would go, they go out somewhere and they'd be like on a star system from one to five. How much how are you enjoying this experience? It's a three. It's a five. OK. That's they like started to use some of these tools I was teaching like in regular life just to do check ins about their experience in a simplistic way, but then also in their intimacy so they could go deeper. So to me, that's really cool. How it's transferable skills. And then as far as going into the ropes, people have a lot of, just speaking to this part of the ropes, people have some traumatic experiences with ropes, whether it's parents committing suicide. I've had many people who've come through me who've had lovers or parents who've, who've died at the hands of the ropes. Even a woman who came to me where she was taken hostage and, and tied. And in these experiences with, with this woman who more recently was with me, who was taken hostage, she didn't even remember this. When she came to me to be tied, she didn't mention it. It wasn't in her awareness at all. She came and I'm like, have you experienced the ropes? No, never. And she was being honest to her knowledge at that moment. She was speaking truth. Right. And then in the ropes, we're getting in this experience. And I noticed like halfway through, like something was happening. And then she just was smiling the rest of the time. And then I asked her in the end, like, what happened? And she's like, I realized 20 years ago, I was abducted. I was taken. I was taken hostage. I was put into a car, tied up. And I thought I was going to die. And she said, it all came back to me in this moment, being tied up. And I had this moment of panic, being like, you're tied, you're restricted, you're in danger. But then the tenderness of your touch reminded my body that I'm okay. Even though she, she ended up okay in the story, like in her life, these guys ended up just like tossing her out, letting her go and not hurting her. But she had to figure out how to find her resources again because she didn't have any, but she wasn't hurt. But the body still holds this like fear, this resistance because of this experience. Memory, of yeah, course. This memory. It is a trauma. Yeah. Big time. Sure. So to get some context, this woman didn't remember that incident until... Until she was in the ropes with me. She wow. completely didn't have it in her awareness that that was her story. Wow. Not at all. And I asked her, any previous experience with ropes? Any this, any that? No, no, no. I've just been curious about it. Zero. And then it happened. And then afterwards, she was like, wow, I couldn't believe that. How, how could I forget this happened to me? But it's survival. It's protection, yeah. right? Like parts of our system literally shut down because you feel like you're going to die. So a way of survival is just, OK, put it in a box somewhere never to be seen again. I mean, that's an extreme story. Yeah. Wow. And what she experienced was like in these moments, I was tying her and tying her and tying her. But there was these moments of like tender touches and rocking and holding mixed in because I like to mix in different sensations into my ropes. Like, yeah, I'm tying you, but I also play with how I, the ways of which I touch you, whether I'm holding you and rocking you or I'm being more aggressive or giving different sensations to the body. I try to play with different archetypes and different moods and all of this to play with your emotional experience, to mm -hmm. see what stirs this unpredictability. So for her, that came up, this fear arose and then this, oh my gosh, but I'm enjoying so much. 
and this actually feels good and I feel cared for and seen and like I'm okay and I was okay then too and I'm okay now and she just was like in bliss after that like must have been just this weightless sensation of like pure liberation right like feeling safe and free wow yeah and then same same with others I've had another client more recently similar experience where she had fears of the ropes because her father committed suicide this way and she comes into the ropes and she mentioned like hey don't put don't put rope on my neck but I want to be present with this thing that took something from me and we went into this dance together and she was so peaceful and and she's like I felt like I was in the womb like I was in this place and I was held and I was cared for and I was loved and just making peace with this thing that has been very hard for her in her life so these are more like rope equals not good but there's many other stories around not receiving what you needed to receive when you were growing up like mm-hmm. there's been people in my ropes who are like, wow, I realized I never was nurtured or never was held. Mm-hmm. And I never knew what that felt like. And then being tied up and helpless and then being held, they just cry. Endlessly, Many people just sure. start just crying and they realize like, wow, I didn't have a mother figure that loved me or I didn't have a father figure that loved me or I never had this feeling of being held. And I love that the ropes have this because people look at it as like this aggressive, like da 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 thing. But the level of care people feel within it sometimes is really beautiful. Well, it's the full spectrum, right? It's beautiful to let those extremes really show. If anger and frustration and a bit of aggression is supposed to arise in it, it will. But if there's tenderness yeah. and the sensations of being held, oh, wow. It's, it's a full spectrum practice. There's no doubt about that. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, we could talk forever about the infinite possibilities of what it can expose. But I mean, for listeners who are interested... And I know you're here in Thailand. You often go to America. We'll put your info in the footnotes for sure and highly recommend a session with Katie if people are interested. But do you have any practical tips, tools for really accessing, like sure, people have to use discernment, right? We need to really do research and understand that everything comes with a potential risk. Mm -hmm. But do you have any practical tips or tools for people that are seeking out emotional healing or turning that mirror inwards towards themselves and to offer an experience that what you've discussed today basically oh where to point people okay yeah for me I've received just like speaking to other things that have been very impactful and influential to me in addition that I've been able to compile into my rip experience is really learning wheel of consent Mm -hmm. Betty Martin has been like really powerful for me in understanding how to speak those things also tuning into like authentic relating and learning how to listen to myself and, and really speak those things. So these are things that like are core to my being that give me the courage to step into more risky things. To me, Shabari is, is quite risky mm-hmm. on a physical level, emotional level, mental level. It's like entering the ring of fire with another person. Having strengths in these other modalities will make your experience better because mm-hmm. the things that I think is like really getting to know yourself. And for me and and parts of my life, I expected others to take care of me to make sure that I was safe. I wanted the outside world to be like, no, you should know how to treat me. And you should know that I don't want that. And it's your responsibility to not touch me and not do this and this. I wanted the outside, but really like I need to keep myself safe. It is my responsibility to keep me safe. And what I mean by that is like if I go into a space and it doesn't feel good, I need to leave it. Or if I need to, if I'm not enjoying a certain interaction with someone, I need to say so. Like I keep myself safe. And by learning how to keep yourself safe, then the whole world is open to you. You can do anything. So to me, this is some of the foundational things that I would recommend to people and and more embodiment practices. To me, at the core, Shibari is an embodiment, a somatic embodiment experience. So learning how to regulate yourself through your breath, through sound, through movement, noticing your emotions, you know, noticing, ah, oh, wow, I, I feel I give us just a quick example. I remember what, this was a few years ago. There was a, someone I had a crush on and I was driving and I saw that they were at the beach and I pulled off on the beach and then they were there. And I felt like from one instance to the next, my heart was pounding, uh-huh. my head was spinning. I felt like I could hardly stand my breath. And I was like, hold on, pause. This is fascinating. <laughs> Instead of trying to suppress it, like, oh, no, no, I'm cool. I'm cool. I'm cool. I was like, pause. Where is your head? I'm like, wow, my head is, is racing and my heart is pounding and like my hands are shaking like In an instant, my body has this response, learning how to listen and Mm. to articulate the emotions, even if you don't have a word for it. Like, I don't have a word for this exactly, but just notice my heart, my head, my mind, my body temperature. How does the space feel around me? How are my senses? And learning our emotions, then from there, we can learn how to care for ourselves. So in that moment, I was like, 
okay, take a few moments, breathe, walk on the beach and just enjoy this. Enjoy this feeling. Enjoy this sensation. Like, and also be in awe that the body just did this from one second to the next. And then from there, just acknowledge like, oh, okay, there's some sort of excitement around this person. That's fine. So all these things are like little tips, I think, to help people really know themselves so that we can do these other experiences that are higher risk safely. Wow. Thank you so much. I mean, that's so powerful. And we were talking about this before the chat. These are things that should just be automatic birthright. They're teachings that we should have known from the moment we could speak to really get to know our bodies, get to know our minds, get to know what are thoughts? What is concentration? And we haven't. So it's a beautiful opportunity now to just relearn that. And I think the models that you expressed, authentic relating, wheel of consent, bringing awareness to sensations that arise is very key. So being a watcher of our mind, what is coming up and how is my body responding? And rather than running away from it or telling it to go away, just sit in it. And I remember you mentioned earlier too, oh, I don't know what's going on. We don't need to know. But even if you're in a situation like a shibari situation and your body is doing things, even just expressing, oh, my body is shaking. Just you're saying, just stating fact. Yeah, it's just okay. Stating fact, yeah. Yeah, like, I don't know what that means. But like, my body is shaking. Maybe like, need a break. My body is shaking. Stop. Just or saying it. Just anything. acknowledging it. Yes. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, such a powerful message that I think, yeah, we can end here before I will ask one final question here. If you could leave our listeners with a, a final thought, an idea, a message, what would you say? A final thought I want to question or something to provoke is like, where is the edge for you now? What is the edge? What's an edge that you want to explore? Like, what is it? And how can you take one step closer to it? Whether it's in your relationship, whether it's in in vocalizing a truth to someone, whether it's trying something you've always wanted to try, how can you move one step closer towards an edge that you feel a little like jittery about? Yes, yes. Explore, explore the infinite possibilities. Wow, Katie, thank you so much. Now, where can our listeners find you? So you can find me on Instagram, if you would like, at becoming underscore unraveled. Also on my website, shabariunraveled.com. You can write me on either of those platforms, find more information. Beautiful. And may people, if it resonates, explore some journeys in the ropes. Thanks again. That's it for today. Thank you for listening. I truly hope that today's conversation was valuable to you. To learn more about today's guests, including links and resources related to everything discussed today, visit the episode page at soulplaycollective.com. I'm so grateful you're here, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the show. So don't be shy. Send in your comments and let us know how each episode is resonating with you. If you'd like to support the podcast, the easiest and most impactful thing you can do is to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on YouTube, and leave a review and or comment. Sharing the show or your favorite episodes with friends or on social media is fantastic and super appreciated. And finally, for podcast updates, please follow us on Instagram at soulplay.collective and at Soulplay Collective on Facebook and YouTube. Appreciate the love and support. See you back here soon.